Hey everybody, um, if we've never met, my name is Jay and uh, I'm so glad you're here and I'm so thrilled to be here with you for the next few moments. Uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge how exciting it is that um, we're going to gather together on Easter. I know that this past year has been such a challenge for a variety of reasons, but the lack of embodied presence with one another, being able to gather as the church uh, has been a part of that struggle. And so, man, such good news that um, as a church community, you all will be together. Uh, and I know some of you um, maybe aren't as comfortable yet and uh, the online services will continue, but so great, grateful that, that uh, as a church, you're gonna have a chance to be together in person again for those who are um, comfortable doing that. Uh, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know that we've been journeying together through a series called The Future of Everything. And I know that phrase sounds a little bit hyperbolic, but we've been journeying through uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians, which was a letter written by Paul and a couple of his um, fellow uh, co-laborers in the ministry to the early Christians in this ancient city, uh, uh, called Thessalonica, and the, the series is called The Future of Everything because the letter itself really hinges on that theme, that the future of everything uh, is, is embedded in one key truth, that the Christ who has come to change everything is coming again. And although this is an ancient 2,000 years old letter, uh, we find immense hope for our day and age and for our lives here and now uh, in the truth that we experience in this letter. And so we're gonna dive in to 1 Thessalonians chapter three today. And this passage that we are in um, today, it, it does two things. It does lots of things, but two key things that I want us to focus on. One, it exudes a, an incredible longing and desire and pastoral heart and passion. And two, it gives us incredible hope and confidence confidence that despite all that we are going through, uh, the end of the story has already been written and it's been written for God's glory and for our good. And so to jump in, what I want to do first is share with you a, a, a photo from my life, a photo that is near and dear to me. This is a photograph that I took on my phone in January of 2018. January of 2018, my daughter, Harper, at the time was almost three. And um, this photo I took on her very first day of preschool. And for those of us watching who are parents, uh, whether you are a new parent or you've been a parent for a long time, maybe you're a grandparent, um, you can still rewind back probably to that moment and the anxiety and the uncertainty and the tension you felt on your child's first day of school. Do you remember that? I mean, I, you know, this was only two and a half years ago, three years ago for me, and, uh, and I remember it vividly. I remember driving my little girl to school and feeling like I was uprooting her from everything she had known for the entirety of her life. For almost three years of her life, every single day was spent at home with family, with either mom or dad or grandma, and uh, every day was with people familiar to her. And now here we were in January of 2018, and I was plopping her down in a completely unfamiliar environment with teachers and classmates that she did not know. And um, I remember how hard it was saying goodbye, uh, both for her and for me. She, she was clinging to my leg with tears in her eyes, confused. Even though we had been building up to this moment, we had told her for weeks on end, you know, Harper, you're gonna start school and it's so exciting. And, and she had even been excited, but when the reality came, uh, she was not ready. She was afraid and she was nervous and she was confused. And um, as a parent, those emotions, uh, I felt the same because I knew the challenges she would face. And I was afraid that the challenges she was going to face on her first day of school, I was afraid that they would overwhelm her. And so finally, I consoled her enough where she sat down in the little circle time with her classmates. And I took this photo from behind her. 
and uh, I'll cherish this photograph forever. And even though it's a sweet photograph for me to look at now, the reality is in the moment, it was incredibly difficult. I remember uh, throughout the day as I was going to work and having meetings throughout the day, I was so distracted because my heart and mind was overwhelmed with uncertainty and anxiety and concern. Because again, I knew the challenges she was facing on this first day of school in this unfamiliar foreign environment with people she did not know. And because I was afraid that these challenges would overwhelm her. Throughout the day, I consistently thought back to this question that was ruminating in my heart and mind. Did we prepare her for this? Is she really truly ready? The truth is urgency like this, uncertainty, anxiety, concern, it's not always helpful, but there is a constructive form of uncertainty and concern born out of our love for those for whom we are responsible. Again, as a parent, you can relate. And even if you're not a parent, you can think about maybe your care and concern in terms of uncertain uh, circumstances for people you love in your life, maybe family or dear friends. There is a constructive form of this sort of uncertainty and concern we feel when we know that those we care about are facing immense challenges. In many ways, as a pastor, I think that my role in large part is to live and to bear the burden of that sort of concern for the people that I'm called to serve. And this is certainly true for the Apostle Paul. He had planted this church in this first century city called Thessalonica. And just as a recap of the last few weeks, if you can go back and remember, um, Thessalonica at the time was an incredibly pagan city. It was full of idols and it was very polytheistic. And because of this, the Christians, the early Christians there, who had publicly pledged their allegiance to Jesus as the one and only true king of the universe, they faced immense challenges. There is historical evidence that the early Christians in Thessalonica had their property seized. They had their jobs, their trade and vocation taken away. Many, if not most of them, were shunned completely by their family and friends. There is evidence that many of them were beaten on the streets and that some of them were even killed for their faith. And so as much uncertainty and concern as I felt for my little girl on her first day of preschool, you can imagine the level of uncertainty and concern. It's, it's exponentially greater for Paul as he thinks about these Christians in Thessalonica who were facing not a first day at school, but literally risking their very lives to follow Jesus. And we hear this concern in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verses 2 to 10, it says this. Paul writes, We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service and spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. And in fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And so here, Paul is essentially saying, listen, I know you are facing immense challenges because of your faith in Jesus. But remember, we told you following Jesus would not be easy. In fact, we told you it would be incredibly difficult. And not much has changed in our day and age. Make no mistake, following Jesus is not easy. And then he continues in verse 5. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter, the devil, the enemy of God, had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Okay, so here you hear again Paul's concern and his urgency. He actually says like at a certain point, my urgency, my concern, my fear that the, the challenges had overwhelmed you, I couldn't stand it any longer. 
It's like pastoral, but more importantly, it's like parental language. It's like a, a loving father speaking to his children. I, I just couldn't stand it any longer. I had to know how you were doing. I love you that much. You are always on my mind. And then everything turns in verse 6. But Timothy has just now come to us from you, and he has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. It's so personal. He's like, man, I miss you guys, and I'm so grateful to hear you miss us too. Verse 7, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live. Think about that phrase. Paul is essentially saying, when I didn't know how you were doing, it felt like I was dying. But now that I've heard the good news that you are standing firm, that you're being faithful in the midst of the challenges, it feels like I've come alive, right? For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. In other words, you are maintaining a faithful life to Jesus in the midst of the persecution, the challenges that you face. In verse 9, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. So what's happening here? Paul, like a parent, has been concerned. He's been overwhelmed by urgency and uncertainty because he knows the challenges, the persecution and the trials that these Christians in Thessalonica are facing. And so he can't stand it any longer. He sends Timothy to visit them, to encourage them and strengthen them and to find out how they're doing. Timothy finally returns and he gives Paul good news. Listen, the the Christians in Thessalonica, yes, they are being persecuted, but they're standing firm in the Lord. They're maintaining their faith and their faithful witness of Jesus. And so Paul says, man, I cannot tell you how incredibly relieving this is and how much gratitude I feel. He actually says, I feel like I'm coming alive. I really live now because I've heard good news about you. Now at this point, you and I would um, be safe in assuming that the letter could end here, that the issue has been resolved, that all is well, the tension has gone away, there, there are, there's persecution, but the Thessalonian Christians are doing great. And so maybe here Paul could just end the letter and say, so there you go. I'm so grateful to hear the good news. Love you guys. Sincerely, Paul. But he doesn't end there. He continues. In light of what the Thessalonian Christians are doing, in light of their action, their effort, their participation, Paul says, now God is going to do some things in and through you. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 11 to 13, Paul writes this, now. In other words, in light of this great news, in light of your incredible work in staying faithful, standing firm in the Lord in the midst of the challenges, now, in light of all of that, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. And may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Three times in this short little passage, Paul says, may God, may he, may our Lord Jesus What's happening here is this. Paul has just commended the Thessalonian Christians for their participation and effort in standing firm in the Lord, in maintaining faith in the midst of persecution. But it's not just that the Thessalonian Christians put in their effort. Paul also understands that there is now, in response to their action, some things that God will do that only God can do. It becomes his prayer. 
He tells them, may our God and Father himself and the Lord Jesus. And then he says a bunch of stuff. May they, may, may God and Jesus uh, make your love increase and overflow. May he strengthen your hearts so that you might be blameless and holy. First, he says this specific thing. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. Think about that phrase. May the Lord make your love increase for who? For each other. And at that point, the Thessalonian Christians would have heard those words and said, yes, of course, yes, may Jesus, our Lord, make our love increase for each other. And then Paul tags on another more challenging phrase. He says, and for everyone else. What does that mean? It means that Paul's prayer is that God would make the love of the Thessalonian Christians increase, grow, and overflow for one another, fellow Christians, fellow followers of Jesus, but also for everyone else, meaning all those who stand opposed to the way of Jesus. All those in this pagan city of Thessalonica who are persecuting and, 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 and attacking and in many ways literally um, risking the lives of the Christians. Love for one another and our love for our neighbors, for those who do not yet know Jesus, is work that you and I cannot do on our own. I mean, think about the people in your life Um, with whom you feel tension. Think about the broken relationships. Maybe it's family or friends, former friends. Maybe it's a coworker uh, or a classmate. I don't know who that person is or those people are, but the reality is in our broken world and in our broken lives, those relationships that are strained and broken exist for all of us. And God's invitation for us is not simply that we, um, you know, tolerate those who we would consider foes or enemies, but instead that we would love them in increasing measure, such a way that the love would overflow out of us toward them, even if they don't love us in return. This is impossible alone. This is not possible by human nature uh, in and of itself. It's a work that only God can do, which is why Paul says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. So that needs to be a prayer in the life of the follower of Jesus, that that we ask God by his spirit to make our love increase and overflow, not just for those who we consider friends, but for friends and foes alike. And then Paul says this, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father. That word for strengthen there in the original language, the ancient Greek, is a word that literally means to solidify or stabilize. It was a word that was used very commonly at the time to describe the construction of a strong wall to solidify or stabilize a building. So what is Paul saying here? He's essentially asking that God would solidify and stabilize our hearts, our internal state of being, in such a way that when the external chaos, the external storms of life's circumstances and situations come our way, that our hearts, our internal state of being, remains confident and assured in the love that God has for us. That our hearts are, again, stabilized and solidified so that they might withstand, so that internally we are able to withstand all and any storms externally that come our way. Again, this is work we cannot do in and of ourselves. This too must be a regular part of the prayer life and longing of followers of Jesus, that we ask God 
to strengthen, stabilize, and solidify our hearts, our internal state of being, so that regardless of external circumstances and situations, the storms and the chaos of life that will inevitably come our way if they have not yet already come, that in the midst of all that comes our way, we stand confident and assured because God by his spirit is solidifying, stabilizing, and strengthening our hearts. And then finally, Paul brings it all together and he wraps up this section of his letter by reminding us again of the theme of the entire letter. He says, may he strengthen your hearts so that you'll be blameless and holy in the presence of God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. During week one of this series, we talked about the Greek word parousia, which is the word translated comes or coming. It's found four times in this short letter. And parousia is a very specific word. It is a word used to describe the revealing or arrival of a king or an emperor or a deity. It essentially is Paul's way of saying, listen, your confidence and your hope is ultimately founded on the fact that King Jesus, who has come, is coming again someday, and in that day, he will make all wrong things right. And right now, in the here and now, you and I, as followers of Jesus, live as, as physical embodiments of that future and present hope. And so he says, when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Now, this is a strange phrase. Who's he talking about here? There is some scholarly debate about what Paul means by all his holy ones. And there are really two camps. One camp says, well, we think Paul is talking about the angels in heaven, that when Jesus returns, the angels will return with him in, in glory and adoration. And some people say, well, by all his holy ones, we think Paul is talking about all those who have died and uh, profess their faith in Jesus. They will be resurrected and will return with Christ to life when he returns. And that's a fascinating conversation, but for our purposes here today, the most important thing to know is that Paul is not whipping up this phrase from thin air. He's actually quoting an Old Testament text, a very particular Old Testament text, Zechariah chapter 14, which was an ancient prophetic text and in Zechariah 14, verse 4, it says this, Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. Paul is very clearly, directly, obviously, and emphatically quoting a text that was a well-known prophetic text about what the end of this world would look like when Jesus returns and ushers in a new heaven and a new earth. What's really profound about Paul's quotation is that when you go back to the Zechariah 14 text, what you realize is that the rest of the text paints a beautiful picture of the future hope that we are called to embody. Zechariah 14 verses 6 to 9, just a, a short little while after the quotation of Paul, it says this, on that day when the Messiah comes to make all wrong things right, on that day, there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. I love that phrase, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it to the east, uh, half of it east to the Dead Sea, and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea, in summer and in winter. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. And on that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. This is poetic, metaphorical language to describe life being, being rushed into our broken world. That there is no more night, that light pierces the darkness. That water, which gives life, flows from east to west. What is east to west? It's a way of saying the entire place, every inch of earth covered in the life-giving waters of the Lord. And on that day, the Lord will be king, not just of any single earthly kingdom, but over the whole earth. 
This is our future hope. This is why followers of Jesus can live in the midst of pain here and now and still embody utter joy and utter hope, utter confidence to live at peace in the midst of chaos because it is the Lord who does the work that we cannot do. May God make your love increase and overflow. May Jesus, our Lord, strengthen your hearts. All of it wrapped up, bound up in this truth that someday the Lord Jesus will come with all his holy ones. And on that day, night will be pierced with light. Dry places will be covered with life-giving water. And the Lord will be king over the whole earth. Jesus has come and he's coming again. I told you at the beginning of this teaching about that day when I dropped off my little girl at school um, for the first time and how nerve-wracking and difficult that day was. But eventually, a week or two after dropping her off at school every day, drop-off became much easier. She acclimated. She didn't cling to my leg. She didn't cry. I would usher her into her classroom. She would say, bye, Daddy, and run in and sit with her classmates. Why? Well, part of it is because she became more familiar with her teachers, her classmates, her environment. But ultimately, what I came to realize is this. She had a confidence every morning that around three or four o'clock in the afternoon, after lunch and afternoon snacks and a little playtime, she knew that mom or dad, they were always going to come to pick her up and to take her home. In other words, she knew that even though every morning she was dropped off at a place that was not home, she had a confidence that at some point later in the day, home was coming to her. That even though she wasn't home, home would always return to take her to the place she knew she belonged. This is the confidence you and I have here and now that as uncertain and as chaotic and as painful and as broken as our present lives and our present circumstances may feel, home has come and home is coming again. Jesus, our King, who has come, will again someday come to take us home, not to a far off distant place out in the cosmos somewhere called heaven, but that home will come here, new heaven, in a new earth where all wrong things are made right. That's our hope. That's our confidence. The future of everything hinges on the promise that God is once again going to remake the world and that by his Holy Spirit, that future hope lives in us today. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you came 2,000 years ago, that you lived, died, that you were buried, and that you came back to life in resurrection, painting a brand new vision for us as to what the future holds for all those who commit their hearts and minds, their lives to you as Lord and Savior. And we pray now that you would um, drive that incredible truth deep into our hearts and minds here and now that, you, that we might embody that future hope in the present in such a way that um, our love by your spirit, that our love increases and overflows uh, to a world that is so desperately in need and that you by your spirit would strengthen our hearts in such a way that no matter what happens externally, we live with the peace and the confidence, the assurance that is inside of us as we await the day when you return with all your holy ones, bringing light into darkness, bringing living waters into dry lands as you come to rule and reign as king over all things. We place our trust in you and we pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.